All right. Good afternoon, guys. Okay, so we're moving on to topological spaces. Uh, I gave one motivation for why topological spaces last lecture. Um, so just as a sort of brief, you know, mo list of reasons uh, to motivate the idea of a topological space. So one we've discussed in detail is that sketched at least, is that continuity or locality is more fundamental than distance, right? Um, one that we're going to stress next lecture is that it's actually very convenient to construct new topological spaces from old ones. Um, that's not true of metric spaces. So it's very convenient to glue topological spaces, to form quotients of them by equivalence relations, and in this way generate uh, a large supply of interesting spaces. And another reason is simply that, well, it's not an empty abstraction in the sense that topological spaces are more abstract than metric spaces. And there exist topological spaces which naturally arise, for example, in algebraic geometry, um, which do not admit a metric. Those spaces, the topology doesn't come from a metric in the sense I'm going to describe today. OK, so that's a few reasons. Um, I mean, I realize I've been ragging on metric spaces a bit. I mean, metric spaces are great. If you've got a metric, it's amazing. I mean, you can prove theorems like the fixed point theorem that we'll talk about. I mean, they're very powerful theorems. So if you've got a metric, terrific. Uh, but the point is that you don't always have one, or it may not be the appropriate thing to use. OK, so without further ado, let's define topological space. So a topological space is a pair <coughs> consisting of a set X, you think of that as the set of points of the space, and a set curly T of subsets of X uh, such that the empty set and the whole set belong to this collection of subsets of X. If you have two elements in curly T, then their intersection also belongs to T. And thirdly, If you have any indexed family of elements of T, then the union over the family also belongs to T. So T is closed under binary intersections, and therefore by induction finite intersections. And it's also closed under infinite unions, arbitrary unions. OK, so that's the definition. So we call the set T a topology. The elements of T are called open sets. And a subset of X is called closed if the complement is open. Right, so it's a very simple uh, kind of structure. Um, me, what does that I refer to? Like I this I here? Yeah. yeah, this is an arbitrary set. So I just mean take a set of subsets of X, each of which is in T, which is indexed by any set. So this is an arbitrary collection. Yeah. I mean, I could state this axiom without using an index set by using, uh, I mean, the reason I don't do that is you may be less familiar with this notation. Since I'm going to use it next lecture, maybe I'll introduce it here. So. If I have any set, uh, let's say, here's a new letter, S. In set theory, there's the notion of the union set, which is just the set which contains all elements which are elements of elements of S. You got that right. 
So it's all the x such that there exists an x in S with x in x. Right, so that's, that's a way of talking about union sets without using an index set. So I exercise rewrite T3 just using the union set rather than indexing everything by a dummy index set I. Uh, okay, so there's nothing really special about using an index set. Okay, so that's a topological space. First thing we want to know is, well, as I've said, this is a more general notion than a metric space, so let's give ourselves a way of turning any metric into a topology. By the way, the empty set is a topological space. Okay, so if I have a metric space, D is the metric, then I get a topology, TD, defined as follows. So TD is the set of all subsets of X, such that whenever X is in U, there exists an epsilon, a real number greater than zero, such that the ball of radius epsilon around X is contained in U. We haven't discussed these open balls yet, but I think it's clear what I mean. So I take all the y's in x, such that the distance from x to y is less than epsilon. OK, so that picks out a certain set of subsets of x, and we claim that that collection of subsets satisfies these three x. OK, so what I'm going to do is check the three axioms. Um, we're not actually going to check that that ball is an open set in the topology we get. That's actually a secondary check. I mention that because when we do the checks, I'm not going to use the triangle inequality. And you might think, hold on a second. How can you possibly be proving that you've got a topology without using the triangle inequality anywhere? OK, so the triangle inequality comes into showing that in the topology obtained from the metric, the open balls really are open. OK, so proof. OK, so T1. So what do we got to show? We got to show the empty set and the whole set satisfy that predicate on the right hand side of that set comprehension. Well, that predicate has a for all in front of it. So if U is the empty set, there's nothing to check. OK, what about if u is equal to x itself? Well, then given an x in x, just take epsilon to be anything. Of course, the open ball, it's this collection of points of x, so it's contained in x. So there's, again, nothing to really check. OK, so what about the second axiom? All right, so suppose u and v are contained in t. So we have to show that u intersect v is in t. To show that u intersect v is in t, I have to take an x in u intersect v. And I have to produce an epsilon such that the open ball at x is contained in u intersect v. Well, x is in u. So using the fact that u is in the topology, there's an epsilon 1 such that b epsilon 1 of x is contained in u. And using the fact that x is in v and v is in the topology, there's an epsilon 2 such that b epsilon 2 is contained in v. And if I take epsilon to be the minimum of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, then b epsilon x, right? I mean, just by transitivity of the inequality, will be contained in the intersection of b epsilon 1 and b epsilon 2. But that's contained in u intersect v.
Okay, so that's it. We've proven that u intersect v is in the topology. So that leaves T3. Okay, so suppose vi is in T for all i in i, i any set. And we take an x in the union. Well, to be in the union means that there exists an index i0 with x in that vi0. <coughs> well, then, since vi0 is open, there exists an epsilon such that the ball around x is contained in vi0, but vi0 is contained in the union of all the vi's. OK, so we're done, right? OK, so that was pretty painless. And as I said, I didn't use the triangle inequality anywhere. That will come in later to prove that the ball is actually an open set in this topology. All right, so from any metric space, we get a topological space. Okay, so given a topological space, and for this lecture, I'm going to try and write x, comma t. Right? The topology is really structure on the set. Right? It's a collection of open sets. Later, I mean, usually you just say let x be a space, and the structure of the topology is implicit. OK, so given a topological space, so T is the topology, and a subset exercise prove that T restrict Y is a topology on Y, where T restrict Y just says the open sets in the induced topology on Y, that's what this structure is called. Are given by just taking all the open sets of X and intersecting them with Y. Okay, so check the three axioms for this collection of sets. So given a topological space, any subset, I get the induced topology on that subset. All right. So now we've got ourselves a supply of topological spaces. So take, if I say Rn for any n, what I mean is take Rn as a metric space and take the associated topology. That's what I mean by Rn as a topological space. And then if I don't say anything, if I just talk about a subset of Rn, like the circle, say, S1 in R2. When I think about that as a topological space, what I mean is take the induced topology. Now, that introduces some implicit conflicts, for instance, right? Because we've already discussed the circle as a metric space with arc length. That means it gets a topology from this construction. It also gets a topology from the induced topology uh, as a subset of R2. Right now, those are the same. Um, but there's a few checks like that that we should do. Uh, OK. But by default, what I mean by a topology on a subset of Rn is the induced topology. All right, so some remarks. Now, one thing about topologies is this is a very general notion. So you basically don't expect to have any intuition whatsoever for what a generic topological space looks like. You don't. Okay. It doesn't look like Rn. It can be very bizarre. So we'll discuss some fairly interesting slash bizarre examples in a minute. Um, but a given general topological space may have many subsets which are both open and closed. There's even a name for that, which is clopen. <laughs> which just rolls off the tongue, right? Um, 
OK, but clearly you can think of examples which are either open but not closed uh, or closed but not open. Just think about subsets of R, for instance. Right? So, um, OK, but be aware that you know, this is not a dichotomy. That's sort of maybe suggested by the definition, but it's not the case. It's certainly the case that you can have sets which are both open and closed and which aren't empty or the whole space. All right? OK, two um, arbitrary intersections of open sets need not be open. I mean, that's a familiar fact from the interval, right? I mean, I'm mindful of the fact that you have a pre-existing notion of open and closed, right, from real analysis. Uh, I mean, this example shows you that it's pretty consistent with what you know, and we'll seal that consistency when we discuss that the ball is actually open. Right? Um, but OK, so in this notion, uh, you can think of a sub sequence of subsets of the real line, for instance, whose intersection is just a point. I just take a bunch of intervals just squeezing into the origin, for instance. Yeah? So that will be an infinite intersection, which is just a point which is closed but not open. OK. so. There's really a, a difference between intersections and unions. Um, uh, what else? Yeah, I said that. OK. So I, I've got an exercise here, which is that, um, you know, Take the circle in R2, take this was the arc length metric we discussed at length, just take the induced metric from R2. Those are not isometric, right? Just think about that. There's no isometry. I mean, just the, the maximum length under this is different from the maximum length under that, right? So they can't possibly be isometric, but they have this, they induce the same topology. TDA is equal to TD2. And this is a case where, I mean, the, the metrics are different, but for most purposes, who cares, right? I mean, it's just the circle. All I care about is the topology, and that's one reason to have the notion of a topological space. OK, so a topological space is metrizable. There exists a metric D on X such that the topology is the topology associated to the metric. Okay, so the examples we've just discussed in the last five minutes were metrizable, right? Rn, for instance, you know, the circle. Um, okay, so let's discuss an example that's not metrizable. So I mentioned earlier the example of Zariski space, which is a may, maybe a more convincing example. This one looks a little exotic. Uh, OK, so take the two-point set. Well, let's agree first of all that there's nothing to say about a singleton, right? If I take x to have one element, I mean, I don't have any choices, right? The topology's got to contain the empty set and the whole set, and there's no other subsets, so I'm done, right? So there's exactly one topological space with one element, I mean, up to you know, changing the element. OK, but if I have a two-point set, well, there's more than one topology I can put on this. Um, there's one. Obviously, it doesn't matter whether I pick one or zero, right? They're two elements of a set. Who cares? I mean, they're just different colors. So I just take the empty set, the whole set, and one of the singletons, but not both. OK? So that's a topological space. So is it, well, let's see. T1 is clear. T2, I need to check it's closed under intersections. Well, the only possible intersections give me you know, those things. Um, and infinite unions, well, arbitrary unions, I mean, it's also clear, right? OK, so that's a topology. So 
this has a name. It's called the, I have no idea how to pronounce this, um, Sierpinski space, let's say. Uh, it's usually denoted sigma. Not sure why. Sigma for s, I suppose. OK, so claim sigma is not metrizable. So that's an exercise. Well, OK. Is that just some artificial thing we cooked up so it's not metrizable? Uh, well, not quite. It actually plays an interesting role. Um, which I'll explain in a moment. OK, so let me now define continuous maps. So what I'm going to show in a minute is that basically the point of a topology is just to pick out which functions are continuous. In that sense, continuity is, is really the thing that the theory of topological spaces is about. And the way I'll show that is actually using this Sierpinski space. Okay, so let's take two metric spaces. Ah, sorry, topological spaces. A function between the underlying sets is called continuous if, okay, so for all say V in S, well, okay, so this is just the pre-image, so this is all X in X such that F of X Right. So it's continuous if and only if the inverse image of every open subset of Y is open in X. So CTS will denote the set of all continuous functions. between from x to y with the given topologies. I'm going to interchangeably use the word function and map. That has no special meaning. Uh, and you know, apropos of the convention I just mentioned, if the topologies are clear, I'll just write ctx xy for that and not mention the topologies in the notation. OK, so exercise, the identity function is continuous. That's clear. Uh, the composite of continuous functions is continuous. That's simply because the inverse image um, of G circle F is actually G upper inverse F upper inverse, right? So it's just sort of transitive. OK, so let's compute some of these sets. Sort of an interesting exercise. Okay, so let X be a topological space. Okay, so I just said the singleton, which I'll just call star, uh, that has a unique topology. And I can think about all the continuous maps from that one point space, as it's called, to X. So what's the data of that? Well, it's a function. A function from the singleton X is just picking out an element of X. And then there's a condition. The condition is that it's continuous. But you can see that that's vacuous because what's the condition? The condition is that F inverse of something is in the topology. But every subset here is in the topology. So that's actually no condition at all. Right? So this is just the set of functions from the one point set to X. So it's in bijection with just X itself. 
Okay. Well, this is more interesting. What are all the continuous maps from X to this Sierpinski space, sigma? So, well, first of all, it's a function. A function from x to the set 0, 1 is just a characteristic function of some subset, right? So there's certainly an injective map. This is contained in the power set x, right? where I send a function f. I just send it to f inverse. Well, I get to choose, actually, but let's... Uh, let's say f inverse 1. Right? So that's just observing that on the underlying sets, a function to 0, 1 is just picking out the elements that go to 1, that is a subset. But the way I've written it, it's clear that I'm not picking out an arbitrary subset because f inverse of 1, well, that set is open. So if it's continuous, that has to be an open set. Right? So that function actually lands in, there's an injective map from the set of continuous maps from x to sigma to the set of open subsets of x. Uh, okay, so that's, well, that's certainly injective, the way I've set it up. It's also bijective, because if I take any open subset, I can just take the characteristic function of that open set, which sends everything in u to 1 and everything outside u to 0, and that will be continuous. So that's actually a bijection. So Okay, so the way to think about that is that if you know what all the continuous maps out of a topological space are, then you know the topology, because you just look at the continuous maps into the Sierpinski space in particular, and you can recover which sets are open. Right, so that's the precise sense in which the notion of continuity is, in a way, more fundamental than the notion of topology. That's sort of the category theory point of view on the subject. OK. Questions so far? Sorry? What's the power set of X? Oh, they're just the set of all subsets of X. Yeah. I mean, that's, to be very precise, not a good thing to write because uh, that's quantified over all sets. but. So set theory gives you this object to start with. Right? So you know that there's a set whose elements are precisely the subsets of x. That's the power set. And you can see that that's in bijection with a set of functions. So this means the set of all functions from x to 0, 1 is the same thing, same set. Well, it's bijective to the power set. Exactly by sending a, uh, a subset to its characteristic function. Other questions? All right, well, um, the next thing we have to sort out is why this definition of continuity is correct. Right? So we'll relate it back to your intuition with uh, epsilon and delta from real analysis. I mean, from the intrinsic point of view of mathematical structures, it's sort of clearly correct because it's a function which preserves the structure, right? What's the structure? The structure is just a collection of subsets. And the only natural, well, I mean, you could try and take the image of subsets, I suppose. But one natural way to impose a condition which says it preserves the structure is just that the inverse image sends all the things declared open over there to all the things declared open in the base. So that's a sort of natural definition.
Okay, so. As I promised, let's check that the open ball is open. Okay, so take a metric space, take the associated topology. So the first claim is that for all positive epsilons and all x in x, that set as defined earlier is actually an open set. to I mean condition two is, is just the definition of the topology basically uh, so there's nothing happening there maybe let's, I'll just put up again what the topology actually is, so you see why there's something to check. So the topology associated with the metric is all those u's contained in x such that for all x in u there exists an epsilon greater than zero such that I mean, the reason that we actually have something to check is that we don't just get to check this for the midpoint, right? I mean, if we got to check it for the midpoint, you just take epsilon to equal epsilon and we'd be done. But that's not enough because here's B epsilon x. What have we got to check? I mean, maybe it's misleading because it's an x there, right? This is just quantified, so let me change it to a y. I need to check for all y in u, in this case, in the open ball that it's possible to find some radius such that the ball of radius, say delta, is contained in that ball of radius epsilon. So it's sort of clearly got something to do with the triangle inequality, right? So proof. Okay, so given y in the epsilon x, what we need to find is a delta such that b delta y is contained in b epsilon x y e such that any z in here, well what's a z in here? A z in there is something such that the distance between z and y is less than delta. We'd need it to satisfy that the distance between x and z should we take? I mean, sorry, what delta should we take? Right, so the x and y have been fixed. Now we need to cook up a delta. Any takers? Well, we want to bound dx z from above, right? So we know this is true. So by the triangle inequality, we know that. So it would be enough to bound this by epsilon. This here is some fixed number, right? Because the pair x and y is fixed. And this is what I get to bound above by delta. So. I need just take this over the other side. I arrange for this to be less than epsilon minus dxy. And that's positive because by hypothesis y is in the open ball, so that is less than epsilon. Okay, so that's positive. 
And if I take delta to be this number, then the fact that dzy is less than delta means this is less than dxy plus delta. Well, by construction, um, adding dxy to this is, is equal to epsilon. Okay, so that's it. All right, so the open ball is actually open. Okay, that's good. So now let me rephrase in the particular case of topological spaces induced by a metric, what the continuity says. This will actually be slicker once we introduce the notion of a basis next lecture, but let's sort of do it laboriously the first time. So lemma, let x d x y dy be metric spaces. with induced topologies Tx, Ty, a function f from x to y is continuous if and only if, and now I just write down epsilon delta, right? Okay, so that says for all x in x, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that uh, x within a distance delta, sorry, y within a distance delta of x implies fy within a distance epsilon of fx. Okay, that's the usual formula for epsilon delta continuity in the real line, right? If you replace this by the absolute value of x minus y less than delta. So you've all seen this, this is familiar. So I'm claiming that this continuity strictly generalizes the old continuity. All right. So it'll just be convenient to rewrite what's inside the brackets. So to say that y in b delta x implies f y inside b epsilon f of x is just to say that b delta x is contained in the inverse image of b epsilon f of x. Right, so x y f x f of x ball. Okay, that's literally just the same logical content as what's in the brackets. <laughs> it seems so disobedient somehow. <laughs> So, uh, which direction shall we prove? So, let's call that statement epsilon delta. Well, let's say star. Okay, so star stands for the usual continuity from real analysis. Okay, so let's prove continuous implies star. Okay, so we're supposing f is continuous. And then we're given an x, and we're given an epsilon. And we've got to produce a delta. 
Well, given an x and an epsilon, b epsilon fx is open in y, right? We just, we just checked that. So by the fact that f is continuous, f inverse b epsilon fx must be open in x. But what does it mean to be open in x? Well, to be open in the induced topology is to say that whenever I give you an element in this set, you can find an open ball that contains it. Well, x is an element of this set, right? Because f of x is in the ball, centered at f of x. So since x is in that set, by the definition of open, there is a delta with b delta x contained in this. But that's exactly what we, we needed to show. So that proves star. OK, so what about the other direction? Given star, let's prove that the function is continuous. OK, so to prove it's continuous, I've got to take an arbitrary open subset of y. And we have to prove that the inverse image is open. Well, to prove that a subset of x is open, I have to prove that whenever I take an element of it, I can find an open ball around it in that set. OK, so let's give ourselves an element. So given an x, f inverse v, we have to produce a delta such that b delta x is contained in f inverse v. So that's what we're looking for. But the assumption says that f of x is in v. And well, v is open, so. There is an epsilon greater than 0 with f of x contained in b epsilon, well, contained in b epsilon f of, so with b epsilon f of x contained in v. OK, but now I've got myself into the situation of star, right? I've got an x in x, I've got an epsilon, and it says it's going to give me a delta. already use delta, so let's call it tau. Of course, in the end, delta will be tau. So the assumption of star says that there's a tau with that form of the predicate being true. That is, b tau x contained in f inverse b epsilon f of x. But b epsilon f of x is contained v, so that's contained in f inverse v. Right, so I needed to produce a positive delta such that b delta x was contained in f inverse v, and I've done it, namely with this tau produced by star. Okay, so that's it. All right, so um, continuity both concepts uh, agree. Any questions about that one? OK, so conceptually, the point here is that, as I'll phrase it next lecture, the open balls form a basis for the topology. And you can check whether a function is continuous just by seeing what it does on a basis. That's the content of this statement. OK. Right. 
So we've got a bit of time, so let's define a basis quickly. Oh. Uh, I didn't need to move that, did I? So is a union of open balls. Um, yeah, so we can do that quickly. Well, I did comment out loud that it's immediate from the definition, I suppose, but that's maybe a bit of a cop-out. So, uh, OK, so two. Uh, given a u in t, so This is not my favorite way of saying it, because it looks like I'm using the axiom of choice. But that's not actually the case. Uh, but let's do it this way anyway, because it's easier to understand. So choose, so go through every point in u. Well, since it's in u, by the definition of the topology, u is open. So that means that there's an open ball around x, which is contained in u. Right? Choose and choose one of them. Right? So choose a delta such that b delta x is contained in u. I mean, such a delta exists by the definition of the topology. And let's call it the chosen one, delta sub x. Well, then u is the union over all x in u of those balls. Right? Okay, so let's prove one way. Let's prove every element here is contained in the union. If I take an element here, I might as well call it x. Well, it's contained in b delta x, x. Okay, so this direction is clear. And in that direction, well, all the open balls by construction are contained in u. So the union also has to be contained in u. Okay, so they must be equal. Now, it looked like I chose for every point an open ball, but I could have just as well said, take the union over all x in u and over all delta greater than 0 such that b delta x is contained in u of b delta x. That looks gross, though, so that's why I didn't do it. Uh, but I'm not really using, I mean, to choose simultaneously for every element of the set some other set is actually what the axiom of choice does. So I'm not really using it. Uh, OK, so that's, that shows you that every set is the union of uh, balls. Uh, OK, sort of maybe that's a natural place to stop rather than define bases. So next lecture, I'll define a basis for a topology. We'll talk about products, co-products, push-outs, gluing. We'll construct toruses and all sorts of fun topological spaces. Tori, I suppose.